the North Sea, the very lifeblood of Scotland. An expanse of water, rich in natural harvest, a plentiful bounty. Be it fishing, renewable energy, oil and gas, or nature herself. It is upon these waters that many coastal towns maintain their worth, and none more so than Peter Heid. The Blue Tune. Nestled some 30 miles north of Aberdeen, on Scotland's most easterly point, flanked by the sprawling sands of Craig Ewan to the north and the granite cliffs of Buchan to the south, is Peter Heid. The largest town in Aberdeenshire with a population of around 19,000. The fishing capital of Britain and one of the largest fishing ports in Europe. An energy giant. A seagoer's haven. A safe port. For business and pleasure alike. A town with history spanning hundreds of years, Peterhead has played many parts in its lifetime. Shipbuilder, whaling superpower, granite exporter, Victorian spa resort, and defender against pirates, smugglers, Nazis. And in more modern times, Peterhead prides itself in its fishing industry, landing some 80% of the United Kingdom's catch, 170 million pounds worth, as well as supporting the North Sea oil industry. And more recently, playing its part within the renewable energy sector, hosting the world's first floating offshore wind farm, the High Wind Project. Five enormous structures sitting just off the coast, each over 250 metres tall. The history of Peterhead is prehistoric. When the Christian settlements of Aberdour and Deer were founded at the close of the 6th century, this corner of narrow land and rock guard islands, on which Peter Heed now stands, were off the beaten track from north to south, and must indeed have been a solitary, deserted spot. Rising from the sea on both sides, from the marsh on the western side, there sprang a round, sloping hill, the crest of which is where Chapel Street and the townhouse now stand. Now in past times it would have been even higher, for the hill has been lowered at least three times. Then, about a hundred yards for the extreme eastern mainland, and separate from it entirely, is Keith Inch, an island possibly nine acres in extent, more commonly known nowadays as the Sooth Heed, essentially the base of the North Breakwater. And further north still, some 300 yards is situated the oblong, low-lying island of Green Hill, so called from its green surface, and at most a little over four acres. The North Heed. Seaport tunes are usually built in sheltered bays, landlocked creeks, or tidal rivers. And though through the construction of breakwaters and extensive developments of the harbour, Peter Heed has achieved this now, but in the beginning, it would have been a rough, untamable location, completely exposed to the wrath of the North Sea, which in itself would serve as a natural fortification. A glance at a map, however, will reveal an important fact. Peter Heed is the nearest Scottish land to the long Norwegian coastline. During the 9th and 10th centuries, Norway had risen to become the greatest maritime power in Europe. And so, when the Book of Deer was being peacefully written in the heart of Tranquil Buchan, who should come for the east but the hardy race of pirates, whom had harassed Scotland for our three centuries? And it is these people, these Vikings, who would know the great value of natural harbours and safe bays, that we can ascertain the founding of Peterhead, or at least 
the tiny settlements that predated it. That neglected corner of Scotland, remote from the great routes between North and South, and little likely to be the scene of conflicts that decide a nation's fate. Here could quite safely be made the base of marauding operations, deep into the fertile interior of Buchan and Aberdeenshire herself. So all of us Peter Heaters may indeed have Scandinavian blood in our veins and a Norse tongue in our mouths. For even the language was speck, Doric, that northeastern form of Scots, the dialect, or as some would argue a language in its own right, is Scandinavian roots. All around the Buchan coastline, there are a few material relics of Norse invasion, place names being one of them. For the coast names around Peterhead are all of Scandinavian origin. The Norsemen gave the name Bugtin, meaning Bight of Bay, to what we call the North Bay of Peterhead. And their first harbour was Bugtin Haven, or you guessed it, Buchan Haven. Buchan Ness appears to have been given first to the point in which Peterhead stands, as the Nays or Point of Bugtin. And again, in Keith Inch, or Keith Inch. The name Inch is generally allowed to be the Gaelic Innes, meaning island. Though the meaning of Keith often comes into debate, referencing the Keith family, that rich family, the superiors of Peterhead. But we'll talk about them later. Round the northern shore of Peterhead, there are three pieces of land known as the Ronheeds the Giddle Braes and the Ive, from which in Norse we can decipher Rundheads, a round slope, or Gedder meaning goats, the hill of the goats, and the Ive comes from a corruption of the Old Norse Hofen, meaning pasture land, or to be mere accurate, land that has been divided by distinct borders. The Queenie, as in our the Queenie, comes clearly from Cooney, a meeting indicating the junction of two pieces of water. Even the village of Bodham, or Botham, is traceable from Padham, Norse for across the bay. And so the history of our people's origin is laid bare. Bullers of Buchan translates from Boulders Buchtin meaning noise, uproar, which, to anyone who's been there, can associate with the deafening cries of thousands of birds. Briggs, bridges, from Braig, a ridge, though the name that appears of most interest in our region is Almanithi, the oldest relic of an artificial harbour, from the Norse Almanithic, meaning public, belonging or dedicated to the public use the first harbour of Peterhead upon the Almanithi rocks. First harbour indeed, but by no means the last. Over time, things would develop, the Almanithi would be left behind. And though the neighbouring village of Buckenhaven would keep its own harbour, as a seaport town, Peterhead's chief wealth resulted from sea fishing. The early inhabitants of Peterhead made the best of their advantage by improving and extending its harbours, and so laying the foundations of all its subsequent progress and prosperity. If only they knew what was to come, herring barrels, seal skins, whale bones, and black gold, and the many fleets to gather such treasures. The prehistoric harbour faint traces of which can still be discerned among the Almanithi rocks, was a harbour in the true original sense of the word, a shelter in time of storm, a landing place, but not an ostensible trading centre. And with the faltering conquest of the Norsemen and Danes in Scotland, the old harbour of Almanithi slowly decayed. It is possible at one time, there was another harbour, even older, 
existing at the mouth of the river Yugi, one on which the old pretender attempted to land in 1717, but failed. More on that later. Peter Heath sits upon the river Yugi. Yugi, derived from the Gaelic Ushke, means water. An incredibly important river. Well, it must have been meriting the name of the water. An integral source of fresh drinking water for those who settled here at the very beginning, and upon which, as time would pass, castles and future settlements would be built. Inver Yugi, the mouth of the river Yugi. Inver meaning the mouth of. Of course, back then, the river was much larger, records showing the original boundaries of its banks now shrunken away due to the removal of its bucking forests. For us, with the rest of Scotland, Aberdeenshire would have once been mostly covered in canopy. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please like and subscribe, because there's still plenty more stuff to come. It's just going to take a while. <laughs> it's been some work to get all this put together, but thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support, and I'll, uh, I'll see you next time.